Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley. This is episode number 71 of the UCF Nightline podcast. Joining us is Jeff Sharon. Managing editor of the blackandgoldbanneret.com. There you go. There you go. And also, I, I believe, maybe possibly a third-party candidate for the President of the United States. Right? I'm not 35. I don't qualify yet. Uh, oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought you were older than that. Oh, forget if, it. No if, I, no, if I was 35, I would certainly be qualified. Okay. In fact, I could probably win the Republican nomination right now, and I'm not even a registered <laughs> independent. I was thinking independent party, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, well, anyway. So, yeah, Jeff's joining me. Trace is out of town. Wanted to let him do his thing. He's on the West Coast, and, you know, so I was like, who the heck am I going to get to fill in? Jeff Sharon. So, here I am. So here you are. Thank you it's, for having me, by the way. Really appreciate no really problem. appreciate the no offer. Problem. And this is this is fun. It's all good, yeah. I've been here I've been here before for the live show. Yeah. And I had such a great time and apparently I didn't scare you guys too much with oh, some of the things no. I was saying. So thank you for having me back. It's all good. One of my favorite people. All right. So we're gonna talk a little bit obviously about the news going on at UCF was that Donnie Jones was UCF fired. The uh, little, like UCF <laughs> fast. UCF fired. <laughs> yeah. So oh boy. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the coaching choices that uh, maybe are out there. We're going to have an interview later on with Juwan Hamilton, running back from Miami Homestead area. And we're going to talk about softball. We're going to talk about baseball, all that stuff. So there's been a lot going on. First of all, obviously, UCF, Donnie Jones. Done. Yeah, uh, that was the reputation coming in, right? That Danny White, the AD, is not one to just lay around and let things kind of fester with certain programs. He has a quick hook if he needs it. He did at Buffalo. And uh, in his first five months on the job, he's going to have to hire a football coach, a women's basketball coach, and a men's basketball coach. So the turnaround is real. Danny's not messing around. It happened. Ryan Bass old friend of mine and a former UCF uh, We've or had a him UCF on. He's graduate. Been on the show. You've had him on yeah. before. He's the one who broke the news maybe two hours after the loss in the uh, in the American Athletic Conference uh, tournament at Am- at the Amway Center. And uh, I-, I think that a lot of people, at-, at this point it was no surprise. Uh, I had said before the season that I thought that um, that because of the recruiting class that UCF was still kind of recovering from the sanctions that came down when Donnie was there, that if we were competitive, even if we didn't win 20 games, if we were at least competitive in our in the bulk of those games, that you see that at least Donnie would get a stay of execution. We weren't but, competitive, it, but we weren't competitive at all. And uh, six seasons at UCF for Donnie, two conference tournament wins. That's not going to get it done. And uh, Danny White so much as said so. Yeah, and and they came close the other night at the Amway. I don't remember what the score was, to be honest with you. Two-point loss. Yeah, it was a two-point loss. That's that's where I was going. And, you know, so it was close, but not good enough. I mean, I honestly, for him to stay, I believe that he would have had to take to win the tournament and somehow get UCF into the the tournament, the real tournament. I'm always reluctant to say, you know, Well, if they didn't win the tournament, a coach would have been out. Because let's say they got to the tournament championship game and then lost on an 80-foot buzzer beater. Does that mean that he gets fired still? So so I, I don't... I don't necessarily, this is just a personal preference, I don't necessarily subscribe to the win the tournament or you're done thing. It all depends on how far you get. It all depends on how competitive you are. You know, not not so much how far you get, how competitive you are. And um, a two-point loss to a team like Tulane, which admittedly got to the semifinals. You know, they got made a little bit of a run, but y- y- you still gotta you gotta win that game if you're gonna if you're gonna stick around. And he didn't win it, and that's that. Yeah. And and to and to be honest with you, it wasn't because you know UCF didn't make it to the conference tournament championship. This was a long time coming. I think a lot of UCF fans have known that. I think I think Donnie knew that, and. Um, and now UCF's in the market for another head coach. I'm glad that he did it quick. I'm glad that he didn't wait yeah. till like Monday even. I'm glad that it was just done because like I I've been calling for for his firing since <laughs> before the season started to be yeah. honest with you. And 
you know, I really thought that once, you know, we were playing those non-con games and, and doing all right. I mean, it wasn't bad. It looked a lot better. It looked yeah. like it was going to be better this year. But it wasn't. It wasn't even – it was one more win overall than last year. Right. You know, so – Not enough of an improvement. Yeah. Especially with the recruiting class. And I know B.J. Taylor was out for the whole season. But – you know, injuries happen. Yeah. You know, it, was this team going to be that much better if BJ had played? I'm not so sure. I don't sure. think so. No, I'm not I so mean, sure. It would have that, taken a not, lot more than a knock that. On, you know? Yeah, and that's not no. a knock on BJ. No. It's um, not a knock on any of the players. Right. I mean, definitely, you know. The message had run its course. We got into the trouble that we got into during Donnie Jones' era of, of basketball, and that hurt, of course, but yeah. it's no excuse. Um, and I think that excuse was being used, and, you know, it bothered me every time that I went to a, a press conference. He'd, he'd always start out, oh, well, no excuses, and then he'd give you an excuse. <laughs> he was a nice guy. I, I always treated me with yes. full respect, like a very nice guy. But uh, being a nice guy doesn't get you wins in the NCAA in basketball. Yeah. So, well, I mean, if you it's look, not that I have any any angst against him. I just I'm glad that he's gone. I'm glad that we can move on. Yeah. And Danny White is a basketball guy right. and we're going to move on. Results speak for themselves. I think, you know, if we had Donnie in the room with us right now, he would tell us, hey, "Look, I didn't get, you know, can't crab spilled milk. I didn't get the job done." Right. And that's what happens. Um you know, he started out strong, you know, those first 3 years, 20 wins. But it, it just it just never got going. And, and I thought it was interesting, and I, I want to know what you think about this. He started out when Kirk Spiraw was let go. Kirk was known as an excellent game day coach, but struggled in the recruiting department. You know, didn't want to do the kind of upper-level recruiting that was required of a team that was moving into the former Big East Conference, now the American Athletic Conference. Right. Um, and conference well at the time it was conference USA still. Um, the question then arose, you know, who do we who do we get? Well, let's get a coach who was a good recruiter. So you end up with Keith Tribble, Florida ties, getting another guy with Florida ties, Donnie, who was an assistant under Billy Donovan, and was the head coach at Marshall at the time. And Donnie has you know that the book on him was excellent recruiter, right? And for the most part, Donnie did the best that he could. But he got wrapped up in the in the, the the Demarcus Smith thing that ended up costing Tribble his job um, and cost Donnie a few games coaching. Uh, also cost David Kelly over in football his job, and uh, and then you took away the one weapon that Donnie really count could, could supposedly count on, which was his recruiting because UCF loses the scholarships. But don't forget, this is a guy who brought Hassan Whiteside to Marshall. Think about that for a second. Right. When you get wrapped up in that kind of stuff, it, it just wasn't going to work out. It was, it was kind of doomed from that point on, which is unfortunate. But like I said, it's the nature of the business. Got to get the wins. And I thought that that quote uh, that you have from Danny White was pretty interesting. Yeah, I want to read that one. But I want to read the quote from Donnie Jones in the UCF press release yeah, go ahead. from the firing, basically. So. That Donnie Jones quote is, I'd like to thank Dr. Hitt and the UCF community for all their support, Jones said. I'm extremely grateful for the young men that I had a chance to learn from and help reach their dreams during my time at UCF. It's nice that they let him have a quote. and Yeah, that's you know, not always something that they do. Yeah. You know? So... It obviously was, you know, on on decent terms. If they're yeah. going to quote him, it was on. The, yeah, if they he if knew. he was going to use it, go in there, yeah. but that, then that means that the result was not contentious, right? And then uh, the first quote from Danny White: "We're going to move quickly to find the right coach to lead our team and bring championships to UCF." White said, "We don't have a set timeline, but we're going to be thorough and ensure we have the right person to lead our student athletes." I'd like to thank Donnie and his wife, Michelle, for their many positive contributions to UCF. The quote that Jeff was talking about was uh, a quote from Mike Bianchi interview that he did the other day in the yeah. Orlando Sentinel. It says, this is from Danny White, you can't just hire a coach to turn around a program and see what happens, White says. It has to be all hands on deck. There are things that we have to do administratively to support the coaching staff. We have to have a larger operating budget. We have to travel better. White says UCF will start chartering flights for road games instead of flying commercial. 
goes on to say, we have to fix some of the smaller capital projects associated with basketball, like the weight room and locker rooms. That was one of the most telling quotes. Absolutely. I thought, because Absolutely. what Danny White is saying there is, remember, Danny's a basketball guy. Played basketball at Notre Dame, right? Um, actually transferred to Notre Dame from, I forget the school, I know I mentioned it before. But what he is saying there is, the state in which he found the basketball program when he got here was derelict, I yeah. think. Okay, Absolutely. what he's saying, we did not invest in basketball the way we've invested in other things, the way we should be investing it now, and it bothered him when he saw that. Right. Um, and to an extent, you know, there have been some. There has been some investment in the program since the old A Sundays, which is when I was, you know, at UCF and I was following that that program very closely. I still do, but I could tell from that quote that it really bothers Danny that it's gotten to this point and that he really wants to invest in the basketball program at a structural level. It's not just going to take hiring a head coach to to fix certain things. It's going to take people, it's going to take a massive investment in facilities, massive investment, like you said, capital projects. So that's, that tells me fundraising. He's diving all in on the fundraising, which they're going to have to do. Yeah, everybody says, you know, that was one of the biggest things when I posted a poll on UCFsports.com about firing Donnie midseason. Well, where are we going to pay for getting a new basketball coach? Where are we going to pay for this? Where are we going to pay for that? It can't come down to that, I don't think. Number one, whether you fire a coach because you have enough money to fire a coach right. or hire another coach. Danny White basically is saying we'll we'll get the money to make this you know, worth it. Yeah. And I don't think he would say that unless he knew that he was going to get the money. Yeah. You know, and, and Absolutely. I mean, you, you don't make empty promises like that, obviously. So right. uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, so far from what we've seen, he did the work at Buffalo, which you guys have talked about before with people who knew his work from there. And Danny White's not messing around. I mean, not messing around at all. No. That's the, that's one of the greatest things. Like he does not, he doesn't play. If you don't, you know, he proved it at Buffalo, mm-hmm. and now he's doing it here already. I mean, he's just been here, you know, for not very long, yeah. and all the, already, you know, he's got marks on his on his bedpost, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, and, and that's and that's the mark of someone who I think is really invested in Absolutely. the place where he is, because and naturally so, because you know this is his baby here now, and if he's able to do well with this program, well then who then who knows what happens down the stretch? Same thing, same situation with Scott Frost. Same situation with whoever we hire as the women's coach and the men's coach for basketball. Right. So um, I'm excited to see. There's there have been some interesting names bandied about. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing somebody who really knows how to run a top rate Division One program. Not that Donnie didn't. I think that he did. It's just that I, I think that some resources got left in the dust a little bit. Now we're going to start to see some massive investment in basketball that we've always wanted Danny to see. Danny White's a basketball guy. He played at Notre Dame. He played in a program yep. that, that invests in, in all their sports. You know, and Of course, so, it's Notre Dame. They have... They can invest in just about anything right, they want. Right, right. I understand that. But, you know, and, and then, you know, his dad being at Duke and his brother being at Florida, you know. So there, there's definitely, he knows what it takes. You know, his, his family members have done it to build, yeah. you know, decent programs. The American is not a bad basketball conference no, at it's all. Not. It, we in saw fact, this weekend, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. In fact, I hate to say it, but it may be a more of a basketball conference than a football conference, to be honest with you. It's, we did finish with a, a couple teams in the top 25 last year in football, but you've got, you know, a, a lot of player a lot of teams go into the tournament this year from uh the American four teams cuz I guess Tulsa's getting a play-in game, mm-hmm. which is, you know, that's Say what you want about that, but they still made it. Yeah. They get to they hang get, that banner if they hang the banner. Yeah. yeah, they get at least the chance to get there. So you've got to come up with the money. You've got to be serious about basketball. UCF cannot just be a football school, especially people. Listen, this is what people forget. If you're even, I hate it when people talk about this because I, I still think it's a little ways off. But everybody talks about the Big 12, the Big 12, the Big 12, the Big 12. Oh my God. And we have talked about this many times. And I just don't think that this that's... This is why I'm on blood pressure medication, yeah, this whole thing. Uh, me too. <laughs> I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon. But if it does, and, and when it does, you better be ready to play basketball. Because the Big 12 
is a basketball, basketball league. conference. Yep. And a football conference. Yep. And and to go in there and play against Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa State, Texas. Texas when they're good. Yeah. You are just... Texas Tech, Tubby Smith. Yeah, you're going to get made to look like a complete fool. Kind of like Kansas State does. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, you had to get the dig on Can- on, on poor K State, <laughs> didn't you? Um, yeah, if it was Missouri before Missouri moved to the SEC, that was who I would have actually dug on. But I, I still say that you know, for basketball, I think the American is just as competitive, if not more so, than the Big Twelve right now. It Kansas is Kansas aside. You know, yeah. um, you know, look at UConn. Yeah, they are. Um, UConn is the premier. I think if you had to, if you had to, if you held a revolver to my head, I would say that the premier sports program in the American, is UConn basketball. It's not any football program. There are a couple football programs that are pretty good. You know, one of us, are obviously. But the signature program of that conference is UConn basketball. And um, and they proved it once again. That they made the NCAA tournament. I think they're a nine seed, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, you know, we saw with the, uh, with the dramatic game that they had against Cincinnati uh, that went four overtimes, um, what made that game... So dramatic, and you know, if it was Houston and Tulsa having a game like that, it, it's noteworthy. But because it was Cincinnati and UConn, those are signature programs. That's what made it so interesting. So UCF wants to get into that top quarter of the conference, that top third, top quarter of the conference um, in basketball, and 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 get that spot that maybe Tulsa is in right now, and actually hang on to it uh, in terms of your regular um, basketball powers in the AAC. All right, I am getting okay. So, Connecticut is in the number nine seed in the in the South, and they got Colorado in the first round. They've got Colorado, and then also I thought is yeah Temple is in that same bracket. Temple's in so, there too. They're a ten seed. They're, they're playing seed. Iowa in the first round. Right. So they both have to go through. Well, yeah, they would both have to go through my Jayhawks. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Cincy also made it. Uh, they're a nine seed as well. They got St. Joe's in the first round. And uh, I'm just checking my bracket here real quick. Uh, let's see. Syracuse then, made it, but they're not in the American. But I'm, Tulsa, I still care. Tulsa in the uh, the first four. Uh, yeah, Tul- yeah. They play Michigan on and the winner Wednesday. Of that, and the winner of that game plays uh, Notre Dame. Yeah. So Tulsa did make it. And congrats to those teams for making it. You know, it's great seasons all. Um, and they deserved it. We want to get there, too. Okay, so with that said, we've talked about the American – what names have you heard or would you expect to have a chance at getting the job at UCF? The interesting part about this is I think some of the names that we're going to hear bandied about, we actually haven't heard yet. You know, you usually want to look at some of those uh, one-bid leagues um, that, you know, ADs tend to pick from for uh, jobs like ours that are mid to upper level. So... Um, keep an eye in this first week of the NCAA tournament. If some of those one big league, uh, one bid league schools, you know, someone gets to the, someone scores an upset, someone gets to the Sweet Sixteen, kind of like the the coach from Florida Gulf Coast who went to USC. Um, you know, it's one of those names is going to pop out, and I'm sure some somebody's going to be like, hey, you know, let's you know let, let's let's go after this guy from uh, Stony Brook or something like that, you know. But um, well, that's one of the guys. That's, that's on is the list. one of the guy, right? <laughs> um. As is the as is the guy from uh, from UNF too, but yes. uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, that's the it, some of the names that were that are going to be taken seriously. We haven't heard just yet because or we, they haven't gone to that thus far yet in the tournament. Uh, but I'm interested in some of the assistants um, and some of the names that may want to get back into college basketball. Um, one of the names that we have on our list here, and I'm actually really partial to this one. Uh, P.J. Carlesimo's name has been tossed around. The longtime head coach at Seton Hall University took the Pirates to the NCAA uh, final against Michigan back in 89. Uh, P.J.'s kind of up there, but he, uh, you may know him from his work uh, at, on TNT. He was also a longtime NBA coach at Portland and at, uh, I believe, Golden State and I think Brooklyn, too. Um uh, PJ, his name has been uh, bandied about there. He was also an assistant for the San Antonio Spurs, an assistant for the Dream Team back in 92. Uh, of course, I know him from his Seton Hall days. Another name that I think is uh, pretty interesting that's kind of hanging out there uh, as far as a longtime assistant, Jeff Capel, who is a former uh, Duke guard. Everyone remembers that um, that 
well, ESPN always remembers that famous um, Duke Carolina game, and I think it was '95. The one that game went to double overtime, 104, 102. Carolina won it, I think, or was it 102, 101? I can't remember. But the guy who hit the famous half court shot to force the second overtime was Jeff Capel, right? Longtime assist after he graduated, longtime assistant under Mike Shashevsky at Duke. Took a head coaching job at Arkansas, coached the Griffin brothers, uh, Blake, and I forget the other one. And he has the Duke tie. Has the Duke, which yep. Danny White's father, if, if anybody listening to this doesn't know this by now, Danny White's father is, is the AD the at Duke. A- AD at Duke. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there's, you would have to think with a basketball. Yeah. There would be some kind of a connection there. There has to be. Yeah. So, Capel I mean, we're was... not going to get Mike Krzyzewski. No. It's not going to happen. It, no one's not going to happen. No, I know, but. Because um, somebody on the message board is going to say it. Uh, but Jeff Capel. Well, I was trying to. Yeah. yeah. Was let go. <laughs> was let go by Arkansas because, you know, when, when you lose a player like Blake Griffin, you know, things don't go quite as well for a little bit after that. Uh, came back to Duke as an assistant there now and is no doubt probably looking for another head coaching job. And the PJ thing, that, you know, could definitely be a reach for something like that. But I think if they wanted to go, quote-unquote, the Larry Brown way, like SMU somehow got Larry Brown yeah. to come and be their basketball well, coach. Larry Brown's an interesting case because um, you know, the funny thing, Donnie Walsh always said, um, the, the funny uh, he had a funny quote about Larry Brown. Donnie Walsh was the GM of the Knicks and the Pacers. When Larry Brown was there and they're longtime friends, he said, Larry's only happy when he's unhappy. I think Larry Brown is the only person in all of coaching who takes jobs for the reason that Larry takes jobs. Um, the reason why PJ is such an interesting um, uh, name to me is because you want to talk about a guy who built a program. PJ built a program at Seton Hall. Uh, and Seton Hall, you know, it's a it's a small Catholic university in uh, East Orange, uh, New Jersey, or South Orange, I should say. Uh, but the thing is with PJ is that he took this tiny little program and built it into a real national power. They were competing in the Big East. People forget this. At the same time that Syracuse was really good with Jim Beheim and John Thompson at Georgetown, and Lou Carnesecca at St. John's, and uh, and uh, uh, Raleigh Massimino at Villanova, and all those guys. And uh, and if you're looking for a guy to come and say, hey, listen, we need to actually make this into a, an, into an honest-to-God, top-level Division One basketball program, P.J. Brown knows all the recipes. Right. So he you can install his book, and you'll be on your way. The question would then would be, how long would he be able to stick around? Because P.J. is up there. Yeah. You know? Uh, I don't know exactly how old he is. I think he's uh, in born his in forty nine from the Wikipedia. So fifty, orders, so he's so, sixty so, uh, something. Oh god, my math is failing me. Sixty, sixty yeah, yeah. seven, sixty six, sixty seven years but old. But yeah, he's an older guy. You know, kind of like Brown is. You know, Larry Brown. Well, Larry's, Larry's in his mid seventies. Obviously, is I, I hold him pretty close to the heart because he won a championship. That's right. Uh, at Kansas. Danny and the Miracles. Yep, and uh, you know that was a, a beautiful day <laughs> in time yeah. for sure. And then went to the NBA and then back and to then college. And then bounced around and back to college, back yeah, to the NBA, so, back to college, and back I mean, to the I, NBA and back to college. I'd love to have a guy like that. that. That would be great. And that, you know, like you said, if you want to build a program and turn something around yeah. that's in the dumps completely, that may be, you know, a great way to do it. Now, when people are concerned with how are we going to pay a coach, that name in particular – you know, he's going to demand some money. D- would def- he's not going to do it for charity. Yeah, I mean, guys that have that have a resume like he does, he's not going to do it well, because he. Although maybe I, I mean, he would, you know, maybe he would take a little bit less. Let me throttle because back because he on believed that. in something. I don't know. Yeah, let me throttle back on that a little bit because at, at PJ's age, at sixty-seven, uh, you talk to any coaches who are who are at that point um, in their careers. He's probably already made his money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like Larry Brown. Larry Brown can can go to his apartment in wherever, you know, in the Hamptons or wherever, or his house or whatever in the Hamptons and, and live out the rest of his time. But he's still coaching, and the reason why is not because of the money. Because he it's wants because to. Of the, yeah, yeah, it's because he loves to coach. If P.J. Carlesimo comes back, be it UCF or anywhere else, it's not going to be because of the money. It's because he wants to coach. He wants to build a program. When guys get to that point in their careers— it becomes about that, that challenge. That That's the stuff that gets them up during the day, and, and, and it keeps them young because you're around 18, 19, 20-year-old guys. They keep you young. They keep you vibrant and fresh. So I, I don't know if the money 
with PJ at least would be would be quite the thing. Now I'm not saying we can offer him a dollar a year, you know, but um, but he's not financially out of our league. I don't think. And I'm not sure where that name came from. It's just it's one that's been you know thrown around. I don't know where any of these names and the way that Danny White does things, none of these people could be. Yeah. You know, honestly, none. Scott Frost's name wasn't on the, the radar whatsoever for anybody that I know of. Uh, not for East Coast jobs, yeah. certainly. Probably West Coast jobs. There's one well, other name that I thought that was interesting, too, that I wanted to touch upon briefly is um, former Miami Heat player Dan Marley, uh, who is currently, and I didn't realize this, he's the, um, he's the head coach at Grand Canyon University in the Phoenix area. Grand Canyon is a, um, it's interesting, it's a, for-profit religious school. It's the only one in the NCAA That's Division weird. One. Interesting. Uh, a for-profit school. He's the men's head basketball coach there. Um, has helped to actually build um, this program. Uh, 32 wins and uh, in uh, and two postseason berths. Um, it, it really helped build the program. Right now, Fans in the Sunshine State remember him because he played for the Miami Heat back in the day. Also, a longtime Phoenix Sun, which is his Phoenix connection. Uh, if he decides to move up uh, a level from um, from where he is at Grand Canyon, he might be an interesting name. I think he's a little unproven at the moment, um, but he would be somebody interesting to see um, at the helm of a program like ours. Right. Another name, Matt McCall. Did we we talk about the, him we at all yet? We haven't talked about Matt McCall yet. No. Now, the thing with him is he has Billy Donovan ties, you know, so another... Another guy with Billy Donovan ties. And I, and I, I don't know if UCF would want to go there or, or stay as far away from that as they could. I'm not sure, so... Well, I mean, Billy Donovan's success kind of speaks for itself. Just with Donnie Jones being the last one, you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but I, but I don't think Danny White would be like, oh, I can't hire another another guy like uh, another guy from the Billy Donovan coaching tree just for that reason. Right. I think it would have to be some other some other reason that he decides not to hire him. Yeah. You know, it, it, it would be... I, I think it, yeah, it wouldn't be... It wouldn't be good practice in that case to did be we, like, did I'm we, not hiring a Billy Donovan guy. Yeah, did we talk at all about Anthony Grant? No, we haven't touched on Anthony yeah. Grant yet. That's interesting. Um, he is a... Another guy with Billy Donovan ties. Because he's coaching with the Oklahoma City Thunder. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> another guy. But, you know, he's a little bit of a younger guy. I mean, he's not, he's not as old as some of the other guys. He is at an NBA team right now. Uh, you know, he he's been around, head you know, a at, bit. Uh, head coach at VCU for a time. That was before uh, Shaka Smart, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, you know, he's been at Alabama. You know, a couple couple other other places, but maybe you know, a guy with and with current NBA ties would be. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know what kind of. Well, that, that that would signal a pretty interesting um, move in that you know he uh, now he's he's actually a Miami guy, went to the University of Dayton. Um, interestingly enough, was an assistant at Stetson in ninety three ninety four. Also an assistant at Marshall, ten years an assistant as a Gator uh, under Billy Don. I think I think that was when uh, Billy first got there if i'm not mistaken he and wasn't at marshall with donnie jones was he no that was that was 94 to 96 after, that was way donnie before jones. donnie oh before um but at vcu was the um uh two he actually coached Derek mayner um and larry sanders who went to the nba jet but those guys are known for their work after grant left for alabama shaka smart came in and took over and now shaka smart's at texas Right, because he had those runs with VCU before it became a really hot coaching commodity. So, um, Anthony Grant, another guy with uh, some serious experience, and was the 2007 uh, CAA Coach of the Year at VCU. All right, well, I think that we've talked about basketball more than Quite we've enough. ever <laughs> talked about on the Nightline podcast before. We've gone a straight, like, pretty much half hour talking about basketball. Well, which... my hope is that we'll be able to talk about basketball a lot more in the future because basketball will be good. Yeah, that would be so. that would be awesome. So, yeah. 
I think that we shall get on to our interview I had earlier with Jawan Hamilton. Yeah. Right about now. Before the new Knights charge onto the field, they're on the line with us. Meet the new players that will wear the black and gold in this week's Recruit Spotlight. All right, joining me now on the Nightline podcast is Jawan Hamilton. He's a running back from Homestead, Miami, Florida, South Dade High School. Jawan, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Doing good. First of all, welcome to UCF, and we're glad to have you a part of, of Night Nation. Did UCF choose you, or did you choose UCF? Uh, both. I chose UCF. I, I kind of knew I wanted to go there in the first place, so I just took a visit, and then everything you know, fell in place. You know, I made a commitment to the coach, and coach made a commitment to me, so it went from there. How much did you know about UCF before you uh, started in the the recruiting process? Um, not much. I didn't know they had an excellent, um, an excellent business school. You know, because I'm looking to go to school for business. I didn't know anything about that until I visited. You know, it's an excellent program. A lot of people don't know about it. What coach recruited you for UCF? Coach Frost, Kevin Smith, Troy Walters, uh, Ryan Hill. All of them. Um, actually, Coach Frost gave me, he offered me, like, first. How big is it that they have a guy that went there like Kevin Smith and that he's on the coaching staff? Uh, it, it's great, man, because <laughs> uh, he can, you know, pick it back in on his days when he went to UCF, you know, kind of tell me how, how his experience was. And, you know, he wants someone to break his record, and I think I can do that. Oh, man, that would be awesome for somebody to break that record. Yeah, we talk about it. We talk about it all the time. He, he said, you know, you, you waiting on someone to break it. And I think I'm going to go right, um, right in and do that. Uh, yeah, because that's a heck of a record that he's got going. Another guy from yeah. the Homestead, Miami area. So there's tons of good football players down there in that area. At FIU that was close, Florida Atlantic, Miami that offered you. How easy was it to choose UCF or how hard was it? It was like in kind of both because, you know, I, I was committed to FIU at once, then I committed to Miami, then I flipped to UCF. Actually, you know, UCF came in late when they came with the offer. You know, they kept they stay in contact with me every day, every day. So I, I scheduled a visit. I built a relationship with the coaches daily. And then I went went up there and it felt like everything, man. I just, I went out there. As soon as I stepped on the campus, I'm like, look, this is where I want to be. And so we stamped it. You know, we made it official. What did they tell you or show you at UCF that made you want to come to UCF? Uh, You know, it's a, I think I just think me. I, I feel like Coach Frost is going to go in there and change it immediately. You know, playing in the Oregon offense. You know, that's something. You know, a running back's dream. You know, because this is what. Well, what really got to me was you know all his running backs, Coach Frost, are running backs. They all you know normally rush for fifteen hundred yards or something like that. You know, the running backs are a very a very important part in his offense. You know, I feel like I can go in there and be a, something special to it too. You know, that, that that opened my eyes a lot, you know, playing a running back position in that offense. Did it worry you at all coming to a, a school that had a team that went 0-12 last year? Uh, no, I'm not too, too um, worried about last year because I know it's a new staff, you know, everything's going to be great. It's, um, it, it's, it's a lot of great things in store for UCF in the future, and, and I, and I want to be a part of it. I'm not too really worried about the past. Right on. What do you think about the competition possibly between, you know, you and some other running backs? There's there's another running back that in your class, Adrian Killings. Uh, what do you think yeah, about the way that he plays, and what do you think the competition will be like between you guys? Adrian Killings is, is a great back. <laughs> we, we did a relationship, you know, on a, on a um, visit. But his, I think his role is normally, his role is going to be like more of a De'Anthony Thomas role, and I'm going to be more, more like more of the, I forgot the running back name, Number twenty one, I think. So yeah, yeah maybe yeah, kind yeah. of a little bit of a one two punch with, with different stuff. Yeah, one two punch. You know, we'll be on the field at the same time type thing. He's gonna be like more like a slot running back and I'm gonna be like well, we both can play, we we gonna switch, but he's mostly gonna be the like a slot running back and I'm gonna be like a running back. So we both will be on the field at the same time, you know, one two punch. For people that haven't seen your tape, I've seen it, but for people that haven't, describe the type of player that you are. Very explosive vision, you know, uh Power, speed—I'm a mixture of it all. I make one cut and go. I don't do—I I don't do too much dancing. I'm not afraid to lay the hammer down. You know, I lay it every now and then. You know, and once I'm past the linebackers, I pretty much—it's—it's it's a go. It's a touchdown. <laughs> uh, we off to the races. What was your greatest football accomplishment so far, like with your high school career and stuff like that? Um, I won Miami Day Player of the Year. Um, it's called the Warren Henry Award. It's like equivalent to the high school Heisman Award, and I just won that this year. 
Oh, that's awesome. Um, uh, the other running back who won that was Dalvin Cook. And, you know, for me to achieve something like that with Dalvin Cook, and, you know, it's, it's great. Because uh, I was the second running back to win that award besides Dalvin Cook, you know. So uh, that's great to me to win one, to win that. Yeah, that's a good uh, name to be compared with. What would your teammates say about you? How would they describe you? Uh, very humble kid. Don't say too much. I lead by um, example. And, you know, willing to give it all on the field, leave it all on the field and take the game very serious. So would you consider yourself to be a serious guy, you know, playing, or can you have fun at the same time? Oh, I'm serious. I'm serious. And then I have fun, too, though. Like, you know, I have fun, but I don't overdo it. You know, I make sure I'm, my head is in it, but I have fun at the same time. What can Night Nation expect to see when you go out on the field? Same thing I, I brought in high school, but just a little better, you know. Be powerful and to come in and make an immediate impact. Is there anything you'd like to say to the fans of, of UCF? The Night Nation is strong, man. It's There's a lot of fans. It's growing and growing every year, and they listen to this show because it's one of the things that uh, you know gives them the most information, gives them interviews like this. <laughs> uh, one thing I would say to Night Nation, you know, stand up. You know, this year is the year you wanna, you've been waiting for, and we're going to bring it. You said you were going to major in business. Tell us, tell me a little bit more uh-huh. of that, and about when you graduate high school, and when you plan on being at UCF. Actually, um, yeah, I want to major in business. Uh, you know, kind of more of the the finance business and finance program. And well, I graduate June sixth, and we supposed to go up June twenty or like June twenty eighth, somewhere around there. Um, late June, we'll be up there to enroll. You know, do a couple summer classes, you know, summer workouts. You know, get on the team and do what we got to do. <laughs> I'm excited, like I told you, that uh, we have so many guys from Miami. I think that that area in Florida is just amazing with the players that we've gotten from there in the past. And I think that these, you know, the people that signed with you, you know, in your class are, are going to be a, a great class. We're all looking forward to uh, Coach Frost and the team this next year and the years to come. I think it's going to be awesome. Where can fans follow you on social media? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter, you know, Instagram. Um, Juwan Hamilton. That's my Twitter, Juwan Hamilton. Um, Instagram, Juwan Hamilton Five. You know, and Facebook. I don't really get on Facebook, but it's Juwan Hamilton too. All right. But I'm always on Twitter, so you can follow me on Twitter at Juwan Hamilton. Well, thank you very much for joining me, man. I really, really appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. So you know what they say: what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We don't need to know about your fun-filled weekend in the city of sin, but we hope you'll click the ad on our website. It's right there to the left, the one that screams you have to save up to 50% off your next trip to Vegas. Just click on the ad and we promise never to talk about what happened in Vegas. This is J.J. Warden, Bill Schneider, Gordon Alexander, Brandon Hellwood, Cameron Stewart, Colin Bell, Jeff Sharon, Kyle Israel, Quentin McDuffie, Quentin Hampton, Rashad Cobbs, Renee Hall, Sia Burley, Stephanie Bass, Terrence Plummer, Tom James, Phil Steele, and you're listening to the UCF Nightline Podcast. All right, well, we heard Juwan uh, Hamilton's comments there. He, you know, he sounds like that he's uh, ready to go, and he's going to come here and try to be a, a factor for sure. No, oh, yeah, certainly, and uh, he mentioned it too. This this offense under Scott Frost is going to be a running back stream, and he fits the profile too. You know, he came in from, you know, South Dade, right, Homestead. They know how to, they turn out running backs down there. He's the quintessential sort of Oregon-style back, five foot nine. Not the biggest guy in the world, but is a speed burner. Uh, 185 pounds coming out. Look at these numbers. 1,259 yards and 16 touchdowns on 131 carries. That's 9.6 yards per carry. I don't know if you've seen his film. Uh, I, but, but I've seen clips, yeah. and it's... He he's he's faster than everybody else. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about faster than Adrian Killens, which is the Not, other guy see, yeah, in yeah. this class that's a running back about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller. Do you remember the old NFL fastest man contests in the eighties? Yeah, when they used to be like Daryl Green and Willie Galt. If you want to have a real interesting for the fans competition, Scott Frost, if you're listening, and I know you are, I hope we so. should have a UCF's fastest man contest. That'd be awesome. And have, cool. like, the top eight guys running the 40 to see who the fastest man is coming out. Because I think that we're going to see some pretty – we're going to see some speed burners this year. And he's going to – and Juwan's going to have some competition. My money's on Killens as far as uh, as far as fastest. Or My remember, money's on Killens because he is the – he was supposedly, quote-unquote, the, the fastest high school running back. We're going to see 
he holds a national record, I believe, in the 200. I wouldn't be surprised to see them both. And the reason why yeah. is is because in that offense, remember, we, remember I, I asked the, him about that, and I don't yeah. know if you remember, he said that he thought that they were going to be a tandem. Yeah, I, so, I, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised at that either because, you know, like we said, Scott Frost's offense, the Oregon offense, it's like the Golden State Warriors in the NBA. I know I made this analogy before, but it's like the Golden State Warriors in the NBA. It's, it's pos- where they play positionless basketball. The Knights are going to play positionless offense. You're not a running back. You're not a wide receiver. You're a guy we get the ball to. Right. You know, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Yeah, I think there's going to be a couple guys like that for sure. Uh, we've got great wide receivers coming. We've it, this this class is going to be, I, I believe, once everything is said and done through their four years, gonna I bet be there's going to be that. some superstars for UCF. Oh yeah, and I know that they're not going to be there, but it's going to be fun to see that spring game too and see yeah. some of the current guys. And I would love to see this guy or any of the other UCF running backs break Kevin Smith's 2,500-yard record. Sounded like Kevin Smith wants to also. That's yeah. a that's a heck of a record to uh, try and chase after how if you cool can get 2,500 yeah, yards. How cool is it for these young players to have a guy like Kevin Smith saying, I want you to break my record, and I'm going to do everything in my power yeah. To help you do that, I bet is what he's saying. And that, and also the fact that you know, shows you the job that they, the great job that Frost did in recruiting, where he where he brought in the younger former UCF guys and said, "I'm going to hang on to you, Travis Fisher. I'm going to hang on to you, Kevin Smith." Uh, I think and, you'd be dumb not to. Yeah, and, and, and I've said that from the beginning. And and you told Kevin, "You're a down south guy. You got 2,500 yards. You know this program better than anybody else. Go down to South Florida. Have fun." Spread the gospel about UCF, and I'll see you when you get back. And bring me back some running backs, and that's exactly what he did. Yep, that's awesome. I'm looking so forward to to football, man. I I don't want to talk about basketball anymore. I want to <laughs> talk about football. <laughs> I want to start watching some UCF football. In between, though, we need to talk a little bit about softball and baseball. Mm-hmm. You were out there the other day for softball. Yeah, I was out there for three the first for the first three days of the UCF Spring Fling Tournament at uh, the softball complex, the Field of Dreams, as I like to call it. And what were you doing out there? I was doing PA. Oh, okay, at so, the stadium. So, so if you were at the stadium, you heard Jeff's voice saying, "This is number fifty-four. <laughs> uh, what do you call it? We had." Um, the, the fun part about that is, you know, you're, you're there and you're in the game, right? And, you know, we had some weird things happen in a few games. And, like, we're standing there trying to figure things out, you know, if something goes awry. And I'm sure some UCF fans may be listening. We're at that game probably at those games probably know what I'm talking about. But um, it, it, it's I do PA for volleyball and I do PA for softball. And I have a blast doing it every time because I get to hang out with some good friends and I get to see quality programs do great things. And... um it's it's a blast because I get to see, you know, Renee and her team and they're looking real good again, man. And they and you know, had a uh they just won fifteen in a row. Came up short in the last game of the tournament against Purdue on what was a relatively controversial um call of a home run that was not um uh, that could have altered the course of that game against Purdue in the final game of the tournament but nonetheless UCF comes out after the r- little rough patch that they went through with including that tournament out in Palm Springs where they played some really good competition like R- Renee threw caution to the wind with the schedule this year and said I'm going to schedule the hardest teams I can possibly get my hands on I b- I believe that that's the way to do it yeah and uh, and she and and she she almost took a note of uh, you know partially from the experience that they had last year where they didn't host and I still think that that had a massive impact on how they how UCF performed in the tournament, and um, and took a note also from um, and Todd Dagenet did that before too, where he uh, had some major you know scheduled some major opponents here that he he knew that his team was ready for to make the leap, and they did. So um, yeah, Renee's been around for a while. She knows how she knows what she's doing. Um, she's the only coach that we've had at UCF softball since they re- since they started the program in two thousand one, the fast pitch program. So. Um, Again, always exciting to be around UCF softball because it's such a good program, and it's a good time every single time, man. It's a blast. I honestly have never made it out you yet. you got to make and it I'm, out, man. I'm going to at some point. I, you, I get so busy. I'm bringing busy. you with me. <laughs> no, serious. No, let's do this right now. I'm bringing you with me. It's I. We have some great facilities at UCF, no question about it. The UCF softball complex is my favorite. 
because I think it's actually visually the most beautiful. You're sitting there and in the outfield. I've been in the outfield parking lot. That's that's no, as close man, as I've been for tailgating space. for football. <laughs> it's like it's like UCF's version of Camden Yards, man. You're sitting out there. And I guess you would see Bright House, Bright House Stadium. Network Stadium yeah. over the right field wall. Right. There's a little lake out there towards towards right field. Over towards the left, it's, it's like the it's the arboretum. You can see the soccer complex from there. You, you, the state the Bright House Network Stadium is right there. It's 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 picturesque, man. It's I, beautiful. It you got to come out be. there. Yeah, I need to. And, I need to go. And there's a pretty good team that plays there too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I, I feel bad that I haven't made it out there yet, but. Let's hear from assistant coach Tiffany Jordan and outfielder Linnea Goodman. Seeing the ball well, making adjustments, and um, our kids were really seeing the ball, uh, making sure that they were getting a ball to hit, and if not, we were getting an RBI, and that's we preach quabs, quality at bats, and they were getting those today. It definitely takes the pressure off of us on defense when we have runs to support us. And it just makes us a little bit more confident when we're out there playing, and especially when we go up to bat. And we know we already have runs, and we just have to keep doing what we're doing. All right. Well, it sounds like that they're uh, they've got the right attitude, and they're gonna you know keep going. I'd Conference love to play see right them. around the corner. Yeah, I'd love to see them do good this year, and and you know go into the postseason and all that stuff. So, also baseball going on this weekend. The Knights played. LIU Brooklyn yep. that I've never heard of before. <laughs> they uh, they must be quite small. Maybe not in Brooklyn. And, and, well, no, no. It's got it by def- If it's in Brooklyn, it by definition has to be small because there's not a lot of space. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I wonder. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know anything about it, but uh, I guess junior left fielder Austin Griffin connected on his second grand slam of the season in the fourth on Sunday as the Knights earned a sweep of the LIU Brooklyn on Championship Sunday. With a 12-7 victory, and I do have Coach Rooney. Uh, we talked before the game; it's really about toughness. I mean, we talk all the time about Sundays being Championship Sunday, and we post signs everywhere, and we talk about it. it's about energy and determination. But kind of those two things together, to me, uh, equal toughness. And I just said, listen, it doesn't matter who you're playing or when you're playing; we got to be tougher. We just got to be tough on Sunday. To me, uh, the story of the game was our was our hitters. I thought they did a terrific job. We had numerous two out RBIs. Two out RBIs, in my opinion, is about toughness. And then all the way right there to the end, you know, we give up three in the eighth inning and we come right back. Uh, all the way to the end. We talk about winning the last three. So to me, that was really the story of the game. I thought we had some great, again, two out RBIs. But right there in the eighth inning to answer back, you know, to have good quality at bats late in the game was a great job. I don't know. Is uh, is Rooney next with uh, <laughs> with all the firings and all that? We've, we've talked before. I, I don't know if you and I have talked about it before, but Trace and I have talked about it before that – the three, you know, systems really, or, or or teams, you know, that needed to be fixed here, and one of those was baseball. We shall see, I guess. Well, it wasn't looking good there for a while because they'd lost seven of eight coming into that series against LIU Brooklyn, but they get to sweep at home, defend home field. They got a big stretch coming up. They got Miami uh, in the next game on uh, the day before St. Patty's, a pair in Tallahassee against Florida State, three against Cornell at home. And then you dive into conference play. You got one game at Jacksonville, you know, sort of a midweek game. But then you dive into conference play. You got Memphis at Memphis at Houston. Um, your first six games on the road in the league and and uh, against some pretty good opponents. So um, I would really now's like the to, time, right? Yeah, and I would really like to see them do something against Florida State. You know, they've they've got to you know play those when they have the chance to play those Florida teams. They've got to to you know do it. Yeah. Did not do well this year playing Florida, and not just so, that, but also you know you got to win those games against the teams that are supposedly below you in right. the state of Florida too. So you got to beat Jacksonville at Jacksonville, you got to beat FAU, you got to beat North Florida, and take care of business in conference. You know if you can get a split from those first six road games, I think I'd be happy. Yeah, so we need a little bit better action there, uh, Rooney. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Rooney. Give Terry a break. <laughs> I, I like him, too. He, but, but you know, as far as... It's about as, the results, and Terry knows that. Yeah. He's been around. You yeah. Know? As far as, you know, teams that, that need to do better to, you know, stay around. And, and I, UCF needs to be uh, good in everything they do. So he's next. If you're looking for a photographer, look no farther than Andrew Fagley Photography. We offer our services at affordable prices and the extreme quality you expect. Give us a call today at 407-205-7427 or see us online at andrewfagley.com. 
www.smugmug.com. And now, news and notes from the world of UCF sports. Women's tennis, the Knights posted a 4-1 to victory over SMU on Friday, and head coach Stephanie Nikitas notched her 100th career win in nine seasons at UCF. Sophomore Amelia Granstrom clinched the match with a 6-3, 6-4 victory. Up next... Wednesday versus Cleveland State, 10 a.m. at the Tennis Complex. So, hey, congratulations to Stephanie Nikitas on win number 100. On the other side of tennis, on the men's side, the uh, men's tennis team rallied to win every singles match and knocked off Cleveland State by a count of 6-1 to one over at the UCF Tennis Complex over by the rec center on Sunday morning. Next up, big match against uh, Old A. Sunfo, Georgia State, 2 p.m. Wednesday at the Tennis Complex for uh, head coach Bobby Cashman's club. Rowing news, the UCF rowing team closed out the Cardinal invite with a second-place finish by its second varsity four on Mellon Lake on Sunday. The Knights collected five third-place finishes on final day of the event. Next up versus UConn at Lake Pickett. And good luck to Becky Kramer's team uh, in that matchup coming up uh, at home. Meanwhile, in track news, the Knights finished third at the 2016 American Athletic Conference Indoor Championships in Birmingham, Alabama, they won four individual events and earned eight spots on the podium. Highlight for the Knights was sophomore Rosie Chamberlain. She put together an impressive performance in the 800 meters, winning the event with a time of 2.06.96. Two minutes and 6.96 seconds in the 800 meters. That's Man, that's a that's almost a four minute mile. <laughs> I, 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 boy, if was, only we could run flying, that fast! Yep. Holy Moses! And she also defeated seven other runners who all happened to be from UConn. So she was the lone knight against seven UConn Huskies, and she won the event. That's so awesome. congrats to Rosie. Uh, she's uh, from England, by the way, and she sat in third for much of the race until the final lap when she hit the afterburners and uh, continued to pull away down the home stretch. So congrats to Rosie. Congrats to the team on the indoor. Uh, championship finish, and now they head to the outdoor season. The outdoor season season starts very soon. Hey, man, thank you so much for joining me and doing this tonight. It has My been pleasure. Absolutely awesome. Uh, you know, to now you get to see how we how we do this. <laughs> well, they say that you, the two things you don't want to see getting made are laws and sausage, and uh, <laughs> and I would add podcasts to that. No, no, no. It's really great. It's really fun. Thank you so much, Andrew. All right, I'm Andrew Fagley. This has been episode number 71. And I'm Jeff Terry. Go Knights. Charge on. Go Knights. To see that charge on to the field. With our spirits, we'll never yield. Black and gold charge right through the line. Victory is our cry, PSU.